Hi, I'm Pat Mangan, Director of Governance Education at NRECA. Welcome to Governance Talk. Well, today, Susan, we're talking about the role of the attorney. So important at the co-op, but a role sometimes misunderstood. So I want to jump right into it and, and, and get right to the question that I hear most often. Who is the client in this relationship? That's a great question, Pat, because a lot of people don't really understand who the client is. The client's the organization, the cooperative, the corporation, the LLC, mm -hmm. the entity is the legal word we use, but it's really the cooperative or the, the organization. The attorney is usually hired by the board of directors, mm -hmm. but the attorney's legal obligation for representation is the organization. Now, they also represent the board, management, staff, as long as the interests of the board and management and staff align with the interests of the organization. Are you saying, and well, sometimes they may not align, albeit rare, but if they didn't align... If they don't align, then the attorney's legal obligation for representation runs with the organization. For example, if you have a board of directors that decides to take an action that the attorney believes in good faith, would injure the organization, would cause a, the organization to violate the law, mm -hmm. the attorney pr will tell the board of directors, you need to retain your own counsel. I'm representing the organization here because I think this violates the law or I think there's a substantial risk of injury to the organization or the membership. Why is it so important to understand this relationship and who the client is? Why does that matter so much? You don't want the board thinking that they can, that whatever they do, the attorney represents them. Mm -hmm. Now, it's the attorney's obligation to say, whoa, wait a minute, our interests aren't aligning right now, and my client is the organization. Because in, es in essence, an organization is a legal fiction. Because what do you mean by legal fiction? Well, it doesn't work. How, how, how do you have an organization that doesn't, can do anything without people? Without people, okay, it's I follow It's the people you. that actually do the work of the organization. Mm -hmm. But the organization represents the membership. And so the attorney says, I'm acting in the best interests of the organization. Mm -hmm. Y'all can come along with me if your interests align. Mm -hmm. And they do. It is very rare they don't. I see. But it's important to understand that if they don't, mm -hmm. you've got to hire a different attorney. Gotcha. Very good. Thank you for that clear explanation. Now, talk a little bit about the role of the attorney. It can be so many things. I mean, there's many different things an attorney can do. Talk a little bit about that role and defining it. The attorney is there to represent the organization and the board, primarily, although they can represent management. Mm -hmm. They are an overall general counsel to the organization. Mm -hmm. You spell out what you're wanting your attorney to do as a board in an engagement letter. I see. And in that engagement letter, you address all kinds of things. Fees. Mm -hmm. How much is the attorney charging me? Is there a retainer that says I get all these services for this amount per year? Is everything hourly? How am I paying my attorney? What do I expect of the attorney? Mm -hmm. Are they to be at all board meetings? Are they per to provide general legal advice? Are they per to provide any specific legal advice? Mm -hmm. What do I want the attorney to do? The attorney can do some other things for you too. Educate you on legal issues and legal risk. Mm -hmm. They can help you with board elections. They can help you run member meetings to make sure that you comply with the law, that you comply with your bylaws. Mm -hmm. They can work with you on governance and educate you with regard to good governance practices or answer questions about good governance practices. They can review your minutes to make sure that your minutes are legally sound. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things your attorney can do for you. It's just a question of what do you want them to do for you. I see. And you mentioned an engagement letter, and that kind of leads to my next question about evaluating the performance of the attorney. Is that something that should happen on a regular basis? And what does that look like? I think you should evaluate your attorney because how do you as an individual director know that your fellow directors are happy with your attorney's performance. Mm -hmm. Number one, think about doing performance evaluations. 
It gives the person being evaluated valuable information about how you regard their performance. So it's good for the attorney to know mm -hmm. that you're happy or you're unhappy. Feedback. Total feedback. Yeah. It's great. Mm -hmm. But in addition, you also know that your whole board's on the same page mm -hmm. if you do it now. How do you do a performance evaluation? You come back, you look at the engagement letter. Mm -hmm. Is my attorney doing everything that's set forth in the engagement letter? Mm -hmm. Are they doing it professionally? Are they doing it responsibly? Are they telling us in advance of legal issues we should be aware of? Mm -hmm. And are they a pleasant person to do business with? Which matters. It does matter. Are yeah. the relationships good mm -hmm. between the board and the attorney, management and the attorney, maybe even staff and the attorney? Now, if you don't know how to actually do this little performance evaluation, mm -hmm. take a look at cooperative.com because there's a sample attorney evaluation up there. Very good. And that can help you work through an evaluation. Terrific. Terrific. So back to something else you mentioned. Should the should the co-op's attorney attend all board meetings? What's your thought on that? If you want the most beneficial advice from your attorney, then I would say yes. Because if your attorney doesn't attend all the board meetings and then you're asking for legal opinions or legal advice, mm -hmm. a lot of times that advice comes back to you from a vacuum. The attorney doesn't understand what the background is, what the discussion is. You don't have had. the context. No context, no reasoning, no nothing. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to get more well-rounded and better advice if the attorney has all that background mm -hmm. information. Now, some will say, it, you know, that's a lot of money. It's expensive to do. You would argue how? I would say, what quality of legal advice do you want? And in the long run, I think it is cheap insurance that you're going to get the best legal advice. Okay. And generally, attorneys will do that on a retainer, so it's not like they're charging you an hourly fee for that. Let's touch on uh, another subject, and that's attorney-client privilege. How does that come into play here? Attorneys have an ethical obligation that is framed under attorney-client privilege. In fact, it's the oldest privilege in Anglo-American law. And what that privilege says is if I am your attorney and mm -hmm. you are my client mm -hmm. and you come to me for legal advice... I cannot be compelled or I cannot volunteer any information that you give me mm -hmm. as a result of your seeking legal advice for me. It okay. is a zone of privacy, mm -hmm. if you will. And the benefit is that the client is comfortable then telling the attorney everything when seeking legal advice, mm -hmm. the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay. And nobody can compel the attorney to break that privilege. Are there any circumstances that come into play that alter that attorney-client privilege? There are, but they're generally criminal in nature. If you come to okay. me and say you're going to kill someone, then yes, I can break my privilege. Okay. But from a business perspective, virtually none. Susan, education is a big part of so much of what we do. We have directors going to education on a regular basis these days talking about cybersecurity and uh, choices on broadband right. and, and, and energy transition and so forth. I would imagine the same is true for attorneys, that they need to attend continuing education. It depends upon what state you're in, but we have continuing legal education obligations. Okay. A certain number of hours of education that have to be Which done I'm every sure year. costs money. And it does. It's so, an investment by the co-op, I'm guessing, or perceived that way, I hope. Well, I think what you want for your cooperative attorney is you want them to be able to attend education that is relevant and specific to cooperative legal issues. Certainly. NRECA does a legal seminar every summer mm -hmm. um, that focuses on all of the issues. It's a very broad spectrum of issues that face cooperatives and organizations from a legal perspective. Mm -hmm. Many, many cooperatives include in their engagement letter that they will pay for their attorney to attend that legal seminar. Two benefits from that. One, it's very focused, specific legal education, which is probably not available elsewhere. And two, you have the benefit of your cooperative attorney meeting fellow cooperative attorneys from across the country. The value of networking. The value of networking, and many of them have had the same issues that you're facing. Mm -hmm. And it's really nice to be able to call a colleague and say, 
what would you do about this? Absolutely. And you've met that colleague at a legal seminar. I have to put a plug in for ECBA, the uh, Electric Cooperative Bar Association, which is also a great source for asking questions and, and, and getting the benefit of this network that you've built at programs. I'm a member of ECBA, and they have a listserv. And I think probably almost every day I see a question go across the listserv and responses from across the country, mm -hmm. which I think is very beneficial. It's very cheap research yeah, that's for, for attorneys. Sure. Certainly. Susan Olander, thanks very much for joining us today. My pleasure, Pat.